From the Spec Network, this is Fragmented, an Android developer podcast where we talk about building good software and becoming better Android developers. I'm Don Felker. And I'm Kaushik Gopal. Welcome to the show. This episode of Fragmented is brought to you by Bitrise, where you can build and operate better apps faster. One of the things I wanted to talk to you today about Bitrise was a couple of the coolest features that they have. And we're going to start off with some, something known as effortless code signing. And what that allows you to do is sign your, your Android app effort, effortlessly. That means is you can upload your release key store file and add an Android signing step to your workflow and you're done. And basically what that allows you to do is build and sign your application from Bitrise itself, which is really cool. Now, another feature that's really awesome is unlimited UI tests for free. Bitrise behind the scenes integrates fully with Firebase's uh, test lab virtual device testing solution. So with one click, you can basically set up a UI test quickly and reliably. You can just you can check the test output, which is going to be the, of course, the console, the video screenshots, logs, etc., right there on your builds page. Now, also related to testing is the UI and unit test on one page. So you can you can view the UI and unit test results conveniently on the test report page. Now, having all those tests put together makes it easily, super easy actually, to quickly analyze your app and identify any of the bugs you have. Now, lastly, of course, one of the last things I wanted to bring up here that's cool about Bitrise is the number of integrations they have is quite, uh, quite amazing. There are over 240 integrations to cover all your Android app needs. You can add them as each individual steps inside of your workflow. So if you if you have something that you want to integrate with, it's probably highly likely that Bitrises has an integration for them. So if Bitrise is something you're interested in, it's something you would like to kind of get started with, you want to go ahead and check it out. Again, with Bitrise, you can go ahead and build and operate and build better apps faster. If you're interested, you can learn more at go.bitrise.io slash fragmented. Again, that's go.bitrise.io slash fragmented. This episode of Fragmented is brought to you by Flatiron School. Ah, fall is in the air, and kids aren't the only ones going back to school. At Flatiron School, the students are parents, musicians, travelers, and working professionals from all walks of life. It doesn't matter if you're an entrepreneur running your own business, a marketer diving deep into user behavior, or just someone who loves design. It's time to level up your creative chops. You can design your future by learning UI and UX design at Flatiron School in just 24 weeks at one of their global WeWork campuses or even online. Their committed instructors have both industry and teaching experience and are backed by their master's teaching and learning experience designers to ensure that you get the best possible support. Now, while in school, you'll work on client projects and graduate with a portfolio of real client work. This will enable you to change careers with confidence with one-on-one support from their dedicated career coaches and with a money-back guarantee. Complete details about Flatiron School, you can go to flatironschool.com slash terms. Again, that's flatironschool.com slash terms. Join the community of changemakers at Flatiron School at flatironschool.com slash fragmented. Again, if you're interested, check out flatironschool.com slash fragmented. On today's mini fragment episode, I'm going to talk about code comments. But first, I want to say thank you to everybody who's listening. If you've been here from the beginning or if you're just joining us here on this episode right now, Kaushik and I really appreciate you lending us your ear either every week or every once in a while, whatever it is. Thank you for taking the time to listen to us. We hope it's valuable and we hope you get something out of it. So let's get back to the show. Today, we're going to talk about code comments. Recently, I was asked on Twitter a question of when is it appropriate to comment code? Now, I'm not going to mention the person who asked me this for privacy concerns, but you do know who you are. So thank you for asking the question. So when is it appropriate to comment code? I replied very succinctly, and then I actually expanded on this into a blog post, which I will link in the show notes. And so commenting code is actually a pretty simple set of things that I do. I know, well, let me take a step back and say that a lot of people who comment code or are kind of against commenting code state that, well, the code is the documentation. And I sort of agree with that. If you look at what the code is doing, it basically explains exactly what's happening. 
I have a for loop and I'm iterating over a list and I'm adding together the value of how much the orders are, or I'm using a Lambda expression to sum everything up, or I'm using Rx to process this stream and mutate it and so forth and kind of get this result back that I put on the screen. These are all things inside of the application that show how something is done. But a lot of times you'll see comments in code and the, one of the reasons a lot, a lot of times people don't like comments inside of code is because most people don't update them. You may go in and you have a bug in your application. It's in the middle of a method. You go in the middle of the method, you fix it. What that does is actually changes the function completely. The function documentation state that it does X, Y, and Z. Well, most likely you probably forgot to update that. And now the documentation doesn't match what the actual function actually does, which becomes a problem. And then what ends up happening is a lot of people say, just stop doc adding comments to the code and just let the code be the documentation. Now, there's a lot of people who don't agree with this and it really depends upon what camp you're in. So I'm gonna kind of put it in um, two separate camps here, though you could put it into three. The first one is gonna be you're an actual enterprise developer, you work at a corporation, a company, a startup, and your product is just an application. You just put out a product, maybe it's like a note-taking app, maybe it's a project management app, maybe it's a financial app. You put out a, pro a product to the end user and your end user is somebody, a consumer out in the field that could be just using your application. The second one is going to be someone who is a consumer of a particular library. So perhaps you are a library developer. And when you're in each one of these situations, the kind of, I've noticed in my experience that the requirements for commenting code completely change. And I have worked at a library company. I did work at Realm for a while. Um, and so what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk quickly about the second option here. If you are a company that develops a perhaps an SDK that other developers consume uh, and your consumers are perhaps other developers. In that case, the rules for kind of commenting code, in my opinion, kind of change drastically, uh, especially for the comments that are going to be turned into documentation through JDoc or whatever, or KDoc or anything like that. And so in that case, it's one of those things where if you're in the second camp, you're an SDK library developer, you should be documenting your, 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 your function, what it does, perhaps it inputs the outputs, the, you know, ex, you know, exceptions, anything that could happen, some expected behavior, default values, things like that. And then when you do update that function, that code, you should be updating your documentation as well. So your code does show you how it's done, but then there's also documentation above the function or class or whatever the state, what that class or function does, uh, and its inputs and what each of the inputs are supposed to be for if they're required or not. So there, we could have a whole episode on that alone, but if you're the SDK library developer, you should be providing ample documentation to your, your, uh, source code. Uh, so that the folks, when they download your library, can have access to that documentation either in the IDE or online via the documentation on the site. Especially if it's open source, then they can kind of take a look at, hey, this function does X, Y, and Z. Then they can read the code and see how it's actually done. Now, where this changes in, is in, if we go back to number one, you're perhaps a enterprise developer, a corporate developer, startup developer, you're not providing an SDK, you're not providing a library, but you're just providing a actual you know, perhaps a application that allows folks to take notes or whatever, anything like that. In that case, uh, these are going to be the majority of the companies that I have kind of worked with and that you may have some code that logs somebody in, or you may have some code that calculates a price of a bunch of orders or something like that. And so if I feel that I need to comment the code, um, I follow two simple sets of rules in this situation. Uh, actually, let me rewind before we get to the two simple rules. If you're not an API or, or SDK developer, what I've found is most teams do not document their code that much. They'll leave the code as the documentation. However, I will sometimes find some code comments that kind of apply, kind of don't apply. Um, but I have a certain set of rules of when I apply code comments in these situations, and here's what they are. These simple set of rules is a, a two-step process. It's real easy. The first one is, if I find that the code is confusing, I'll try to refactor the code so that's not confusing anymore. So if we have a weird function, I'll try to just, you know, if it's really complex, I'll try to simplify it. I'll try to refactor it so it's not confusing and it's very obvious what happens. This could take into account of, hey, the variable names are wrong. The function name is wrong. We're not describing what we're doing. 
Uh, I don't know how many times you've run into this, but I've run into it many times in my consulting career where perhaps a function name is incorrect or a variable name is incorrect. And I think it does one thing and then I realize it does something completely different, which is where the code's confusing. And just changing a variable name or a function name, anything like that can have drastic effects on the code readability. Now, if for whatever reason I've refactored as far as I can and it's still confusing and, a ref and this is step two, if a refactoring is not possible, I document the why, not the how. Remember the how is already documented, that's the code itself. The why that you're gonna document in a, in a comment is gonna explain why that code exists and perhaps some important and relevant details that might not be evident to any future maintainers. So usually the next point, question at this point when I'm having a conversation with someone is, how do I know if I should provide a why comment? And to answer this question, I usually ask myself this one simple question. In six months, will I be able to understand this code in 30 seconds or less? And if there's any doubt in my mind that they say, maybe, uh, yeah, I won't understand it. If there's any doubt in my mind that I know that I need to provide a why comment for that chunk of code. All right, so why 30 seconds though? The reason is because the majority of my time as a developer will be spent reading and deciphering existing code. I need to be able to do this as quickly as possible and be as efficient as possible when I do this. And if a comment, maybe even a simple one, helps me grok something quickly due to some weird edge case complexity that's inside of the code, then that comment is basically worth its weight in gold, meaning that it's very useful. Because if perhaps I've, I don't know how many times I've run into this, perhaps seen a long, thing inside of a, a class where we're using Rx to do something and I'm looking at it and thinking, wow, this is overly complicated. I have no idea why this is happening. And a few instances I've run into a code block where perhaps a coworker has left the why comment of like the reason why we're doing it this way is because of blah, 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 blah. And it almost draws out this diagram in my head of like, oh, okay, I know why we're using that operator. I know why we're using that. I know why this is happening. Okay, this all makes sense now. Okay, great. If that wasn't there, I'd have to sit in front of that code for 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 minutes, an hour, two, three, four hours, half a day, who knows, to figure out what is going on. So again, this is a pretty short one here. Uh, to recap, when is it appropriate to comment code? Uh, a set of two simple rules. Number one, if the code's confusing, try to refactor the code so it's not confusing anymore. Number two, if a refactoring is not possible, document the why, not the how. The how is already documented. That's the code. The why explains why the code exists and perhaps some more relevant details that might not be evident to people who are maintaining the code in the future. And again, why? Uh, how do we know if we should provide a why? If you can't, if in six months you don't understand the code in 30 seconds, it probably means you need to provide a why comment. Now, I hope that helps. If you have some other thoughts or you have some other tips on how you provide code comments, we would love to see it on the fragmentedpodcast.com site. We have a comment section there. Please drop it in there, or you can also reply to us right on Twitter at, at FragmentedCast. Thanks again for listening, and we'll catch you in the next episode. Before we get going here, I want to say one quick thing about our sponsor, BitRise. With BitRise, you can build and operate better apps faster. We mentioned a couple of things at the beginning of the episode, and I'll just quickly cover them here. You can have effortless code signing. Upload your key store, get your application signed. You can run unlimited UI tests for free with Firebase Test Lab's virtual device testing solution that's integrated in. You can take those tests, and along with your unit test reports, view all the results on one page, which makes it super convenient and easy to analyze your application. And of course, there's an insane number of integrations where you can integrate BitRise with any of the tools you use in your current workflow. If BitRise is something you're interested in, please go to go.bitrise.io slash fragmented. Again, that's go.bitrise.io slash fragmented. Thanks, BitRise. Flatiron School is a sponsor of Fragmented. At Flatiron School, you learn how the future is being built so that you can change anything, starting with a new career in UX and UI design. To learn more, you can go to flatironschool.com slash fragmented. Again, that's flatironschool.com slash fragmented. That's it for the show, folks. Fragmented is hosted by Don Felker and me, Kaushik Gopal. We edit and produce all the episodes here on Fragmented. Sarah the Amazing Jackson from the Spec Network helps with production assistance and wraps our final mix. Our theme and ad music is by the national recording artist Blueprint from Weightless Recordings. You can find more fragmented episodes at fragmentedpodcast.com. Thanks for listening, and we will catch you in the next episode.